Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Indie 11 Podcast. I'm your host, Brendan Griffiths, and this is the show where we bring on those from the world of football to show you what it takes to be in the 11 at the highest possible level. This week's guest is near and dear to my heart. Coach Zach Sebastandira is in the 11, my former collegiate coach when I was playing at Chestnut Hill College. I went on to be his assistant for another year at Chestnut Hill as well. And this one is, is definitely one of my favorite episodes. We reminisce and catch up and just honestly kind of kick it for about an hour and a half. And I am extremely grateful to, to have this episode, as we allude to in the episode. He told me very early on, because I was uh, hoping to have him on as a guest much earlier in the in the process, but he told me very early on, I'll come on episode 100. So we had to wait until now, and, and obviously there's so much that I can say about episode 100. One, having it be a special guest, but two, just the fact that we've now done 100 of these episodes, man, it, it kind of blows my mind. and It feels very cool to have this special milestone here and be able to share it with somebody like Zach. So... This is definitely one of my favorite episodes. I hope that, you know, there's value that you can definitely take from this episode and there's lots to learn in here. It may not be your traditional, hey, here's the story of a pro that we have had in some of the other episodes, but I hope if you can take even just, you know, kind of listening in, being a fly on the wall for what it's like for a former player and coach to just catch up and kind of reminisce on some of the old days, but more so just talk about life and, and chit chat. And hopefully this reminds you of maybe a relationship you have with a coach or a relationship you have with a player. And if I can do that for you, then, then hopefully that was a success in the eyes of this episode. So as I mentioned, a hundred episodes now in the bank, crazy. I cannot even believe it. If you had asked me when I first started, would I make 100 of these episodes, I would have told you I have no idea, but <laughs> the odds uh, were not in the favor of 100 episodes. I would, have, I would have definitely hammered the under if I was being honest with you, but I can't thank everyone here enough. Everyone who's been on the show up to this point, it, you have been such a huge instrumental part in me getting to 100 episodes. I couldn't have done it without you. Everyone who has continued to listen. Again, same goes to you. I, I wouldn't do this if I didn't know that it was affecting people and, and that people were interested in listening out there. And I especially thank you to all of those of you out there who have, you know, shown your support in, in whether it's sending me a message, whether it's following the content, liking, subscribing, sharing, all of those little things that help the show grow. Um, it, it means the world to me. It truly, truly does. Especially even those of you who have joined the Patreon as well. That's another way for those of you that, uh, would like to show a little bit more support to the podcast. I'd appreciate that. Patreon.com slash in the 11 pod, but man, a hundred episodes down and I guess here's to a hundred more and here's myself. fitting for a very special episode, episode 100, that we have a very special guest in the building. I was told very, very early on in my podcast career, I said, hey, when are you coming on? I need to have you on. And from early doors, you said, I need a, I need a big milestone, uh, a big milestone episode. I need episode 100. And I was like, and I think at the time I asked you at like episode six, I was like, God damn, I guess we got to do 94 more of these then just to get <laughs> just to get on. Let's so start. without further ado, without further uh, introduction, Zach Sebastandira is in the 11. Thank you so much, my friend. Looking forward to uh, to talking. Listen, let's set the record straight, right? You okay. started this thing and you're like, oh, I need guests. I go, all right, I'll be guest 100. Because if you're uh -huh. going to do it. Right. To be fair, the, what I actually said is you're going to be rubbish for a while. Uh -huh. Then at some point you get good. Then you get rubbish again and then you get excellent. So I want to be at that tipping point and clearly. Right. But also, let's be honest. Anytime somebody's ever thrown you a challenge in your life, you sulked about it. 
then you went and were bitter about it, and then you did something about it. So, yes, of course, episode 100. Here we go. The next time you'll see me is a thousand. I'm just letting you know. I'm just going to double down right here for the record. Episode a thousand. Sign me up. My like, God, we're gonna have to just start posting like throwaway episodes about nothing just to get you on the <laughs> little five minute Listen. snips. Hey, I've done ten episodes this week. Let's go. We're climbing the ladder. Listen, however you get there, one thousand, I got you. Okay, okay, that's fair. This is this is only fitting the perfect way to start this? I had this little this little bit that I wrote. I was gonna I was gonna really gas you up, talk about the the our relationship, how much you've meant to me, and then right off the bat, just coming in hot with. I knew you were going to be shit in the beginning and you were going to maybe get a little bit good and probably be shit again. This is the only way that it works with us. Listen, go look at the comments. They'll tell you the same thing, right? A little bit of turbulence and then grind phase and then you're flying again. And then, right? So why would this conversation be any different? (laughs) Oh, so you're just the voice of the people then is what you're telling me. You just, you're able to encapsulate what the people say. I have two goals on this podcast. First okay. one, and this one I've always hammered on, is I need Mama G swag. Yep. Mama G's come on in a couple of episodes. She's my favorite podcast guest. She should be a co-host at this stage as far as I'm concerned. But either <laughs> way, I need Mama G gear. And then, yeah, I'm here to represent the people. I'm deep in the comments thread. So I'm here as the voice of the people. So Okay, so fair enough. Me. So whatever, whatever, you know image I get from you is based on what the people are saying, whether it's negative or positive, you're deep in the Reddit threads. And I'm about to know exactly how the people Basically, feel about the podcast right now. There's an entire sub stack dedicated to this podcast and I'm the editor in chief. So hell yeah. If hell you ever yeah. wanted to know what we're saying deep in the chat, I'm here for you. And for those who are wondering about the mama G part as well, my, I've had my mom on the episode of the podcast twice now. And a little sneak peek for those who may be wondering, my family is actually coming to visit down in Australia in a couple of weeks. I'm thinking we may even introduce the sister as well. We may get a triple mom, sister, myself episode on. It's it's all mad. So from the from the earliest of days when Coach listened to this episode with my mom on it, he was like, when's the merch coming out? When's the Mama G merch coming out? And that's, he's, he's remained true. He's remained uh, loyal to that exact statement and has wanted the merch ever since it was realmed uh, a possibility. So it's coming. It's in production. Okay. Listen, you said that on episode 25, I think, where she made her debut and we're still waiting. So <laughs> I don't know who we need to talk to. I might need to talk to a manager, but listen, we need, we need the merch because your okay. mom stays dropping gems. Like if you haven't listened to that episode, you're like. And like, just to make it serious for like half a second before we go back to the banter, what's really beautiful about that podcast is a lot of people don't actually get to talk to their parents in that way. Yeah. So there's something about an interview that forces you to be very focused on your questions. And what's really cool, and this is why I'm a big fan of your mom, is she has a wonderful way of echoing what your feelings are. So it's really cool to listen to, like, you be explaining a feeling like 52,000 words the way you do. And you can just tell she knows where you're going to land, but she lets you get it out. (laughs) And then she meets you where you are in a way that is, it's not demeaning in any way, right? Because sometimes it can feel like people are just listening to reply or they're listening to make you feel better. She goes there with you without filling the space right it's like it's a really cool superpower empath ability she has which is why i need the merch i need a hoodie that just cut cut that clip and just typeface it out and then just i don't know mama g (laughs) on the back we'll we'll let you know i'll get back in the comments and we'll figure out yeah exactly as long as you're promoting it in the reddit threads and we can get you know we can get the merch out to the people then then i'm down then i'm down yep I am the people. The people okay. are I. Ah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> My bad. No, but I think I think that's a really good segue into, uh, you know, I, I completely agree. I think for me and my experience with this podcast and my experience with my career and, and my experience with my life, my mom has been hugely pivotal in being that support system for me. 
um, you know, because I speak about it on this show that a career like this, you know, trying to kick a ball for a living while on the surface may seem like an easy feat. It, it often is met with a lot of adversity and a lot of challenges. And you need people in your corner that are going to be able to support you through the, the, the turbulence, as you, as you said. Um, and so it, the reason why it's a perfect segue as well for this episode is because you have also been such a, a key kind of cog in that machine for me as well over the course of, you know, for the people that are, are wondering here, I played for coach Zach and it's funny. I still call him coach Zach, even to this day. Um, I played for him actually only for, <laughs> only for a year uh, at Chestnut Hill. Cause he came into the role uh, in my second year at the school and we had a coaching replacement and then I coached for you for a year. So really our, I guess, working relationship was, was fairly brief, right? Compared to most college athletes, they may have a coach for the span of four years. Um, ours was only really that one. And then I coached for you for another year, but still to this day, um, you know, someone who I talk to on a consistent basis, someone who I go to for advice and counsel and has been a support system through all of it, whether it's, you know, I'm in some, uh, I'm in some random German city and I'm trying to figure out how to get home or I'm in Denmark having a breakdown after I come home from a training session, like whatever it is, it's Zach has a very, uh, adept ability to kind of figure out immediately within the first couple minutes of the call. If I'm coming to from a place from what am I looking for? Banter? Is it jokes? Is it support? Is it advice? Is it all right? He's kind of <laughs> down in the shitter right now. We need to somehow figure out how to support him and bring him back up. So I think, so obviously speaking to, with, in regards to my mom, it's been hugely grateful to have her as a sports system, but I can say as well that it's been, hu I am hugely grateful um, and appreciative of everything that you've done for me over the course of my career, over the course of our time, knowing each other in our relationship. And that's the only nice thing that I'm going to say for the rest of this podcast. And Thank then the rest you, of it, we're just going to chat shit. I know that you're still in control right now. <laughs> <laughs> this was, yeah. To be fair, though, um, uh, the missus has told me that I'm terrible at taking compliments. So I'm just going to clip this part of the podcast where there was just dead air and I was just taking it. And I'm just okay. going to send that to her and say, see, I'm capable. I'm just going to clip out all the return <laughs> to business or we just start throwing flames. But no, like, listen, like, that's what a coach is supposed to do. Mm. Right? Like all those things that you describe, that is what a coach is supposed to do, right? Um, and I, again, that's why I'll keep referencing your mother. I'll keep referencing that podcast is your mother is the epitome of what a good coach should be. And for a lot of us, your first teacher, your first coach is your parents. So, and the reason I keep coming back to this is I think part of the reason I said get to a hundred podcasts was to do this a hundred times. You have to meet a lot of people that are actually important in your life and actually sit in front of them and ask them questions. And a lot of us, unfortunately, don't realize we didn't ask people questions until they're not here anymore. So for anybody listening, like this is just a great exercise. Whether you make it a podcast or you make it a journal, just start interviewing the people in your life. Like we have so many tech pieces now where you can record the voice of your dad or the voice of your grandma just to kind of like, hey, dad, what was it like when you were 16? And like, get in the archives, right? For anybody that was born after 1985, most of their stuff is digital now, Yeah. right? You can go dig and find, you know, your dad was an All-American or your mom was in her third career by the time she had you. And collecting those stories, um, there's this social media thing called, um, I think it started out being Humans of New York, but it's now Humans of Everywhere with like everyday yeah. people telling their stories. And you'd be surprised, like, if you're curious about someone, they actually become more interesting. Mm. And a lot of time we put that interest on people who are not in our lives and we don't do it for the people who are literally, like, right next to us, right? right. Yeah. Um, and that was what was a beautiful thing. On top of all the really cool things that your mom is, what was really beautiful about that moment is I know that you can pull up that podcast episode and you can give it to your kids. Right, you can give it to a complete stranger and go. This is the type of coach I'd like to be. Right, so yeah, that's 
That's why I thought that one, one big fan of your mom, two, just the catharsis of that moment. But three, yeah. for anybody that's listening, doesn't take much. Just put the audio button on on your phone and just have a chat, right? Like even in the exercise of doing the prep work, God only knows what you find on the Googles while you're Googling me to prepare for this interview. But even as I say that, you didn't prepare. You just turn this bloody thing on and away we go. But just I will share my screen person. right now and show you the notes that I have up. I swear <laughs> to God, I do. You think I'm some amateur after doing this for 100 episodes. <laughs> well, listen, you have to make your bones somewhere, right? Exactly. Um, I yeah, think, I think it's a... Thing away it, from this, it's that. Go I think it's an interesting point that you bring up in terms of the type of coach that you want to be. Because it's something that I think, as I've known you, I've always kind of... I've realized that to you your philosophy towards coaching or the way that you approach coaching has always been much more immersive than just what happens inside the white lines and much more in depth than, than just X's and O's and tactics and, and technical things and, and, and things like that. Has that always been something that you have been conscious of as you have approached the game as like, this is somewhere where I can affect people or was it just, Maybe talk to me a little bit about your coaching philosophy or what brought you into coaching and how you kind of adapted that mindset. So I'll be honest. I don't like the word coaching philosophy. Okay. Because I think it a philosophy is a way of living, right? So if you ask somebody, what's your philosophy as a baker? Go get a cake that they baked and eat it. If there's a lot of salt in it, if there's a lot of butter, you can kind of taste where their influences came from. I'm too young to have a philosophy, right? So, like, you look at my body of work, I've only been coaching for 15 years. I don't have a philosophy yet. But on a human level, I've always been endlessly fascinated by people. Some of it is because I was a really shy kid. So... What comes out when I coach is really, you know, I put a team together. I'm not just looking at the left back and saying, hey, this guy's left footed. I'm looking at it and say, hey, this is Paris Bruin. He's from Germany, but he's also got family from Greece. And if I push the right buttons at the beginning of the game, he's going to play like a man with his hair on fire. If I don't, he's just going to cruise into idle. And to me, that is going back to the conversation we had earlier about being curious about people. So there's people who go through the world saying people are boring. And then there's people like me who go, if I'm curious enough about that person, I'll find something that I can connect with. And then the real fun starts, right? Um, and I've told you this a, a lot of time in preseason that if we, if we do a season right, by the time we get to October, the group should have taken over. Right, So you do a lot of the pushing early doors to build relationships, to get guys to close together. But by the time we get to October, if you have the right group and you've done your job, as a coach, you should not be necessarily anymore. Right. So, And I remember I said this during my interview at Chestnut Hill. I forget who asked me. I think one of the boys asked me what I was good at. And I was like, I, build, I bring groups of people together really well. Right. Um, and I think a lot of coaches forget that you're also a person. So if you found me off the soccer field, I'd be the same person, right? I'd be curious about whoever I'm talking to. I'd be trying to make that connection because what I found is really fascinating things happen once you make that connection. And the moment you figure out what drives someone, what they're afraid of, what gets them excited, and you can resonate on that level, everything downstream of that is good, right? Like we would always talk about how when you finish playing for me as a college player, four months after your last game as a senior, you were 25% better. Yeah. Right? Not because of anything else. Other, you, you just got more comfortable. And a lot of the work we were doing outside of the field, just sitting and kind of talking through some mental stuff, just barriers, right? Like, hey, how do I solve this problem? Hey, because the potential was always there, right? It, potential was always there. Hey, this could be a really good midfielder. But we just hadn't had the time just as people to vibe back and forth. And once we started to unlock some of those blocks, suddenly you jumped into training and I was like, there he is. 
right? Like, like yep. there, there is a truest version of him. And it's a very long answer, but as a coach, if you can unlock the thing that's stopping a player from bringing their truest version to the field, there's no limits to what they can do, mm. right? So if I had a coaching philosophy, it's somewhere along the lines of, if I do this right, the player's going to do things that I, I couldn't put a ceiling on. They're going to surprise me. But my job is to bring the full version of them into the work that they do. And that, yeah. that's where it becomes a little bit of alchemy, a little bit of witchcraft, a little bit of woo-woo, a little, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's all those, those tools you bring to bear to pull that person out. As, as you look at maybe as you reflect on some of the places that you've coached and and maybe just look at the landscape of the game as a whole, do you think that's that much more important to, you know, and maybe just to provide context to this, right? In, in college soccer, there's a, a, a wide variety of programs in terms of level, in terms of resources, in terms of support, right? So, for example, a school like Chestnut Hill may not have the same kind of financial resources or the ability to bring in the same talent of players, the same caliber, um, you know, may not have the same facilities, things of that nature. Were you kind of keenly aware of that in your coaching career that I needed to become that much more immersive in the, the ability to make those relationships with players in order to also get the best out of them? Or was it more so just, I think this is how I would be regardless of if I'm coaching the national team or if I'm coaching, you know, a U12 team. So I'll, I'll be honest, um, and we would always talk about this. I did this with your senior group, so with Joe and like all those boys where it was like, here's a box. In this box, we're going to put all the things we can't control. Mm. We don't have great facilities. The bus might break down. We didn't get food. We just put it in this box. Yeah. And we're going to take this box. We're going to look at it, and we're going to acknowledge that this box exists, and then we're going to put it over here, and we're going to get to work, right? And the reason that's important is I had really good coaches, right? And what a really good coach did for me when I was a player was they made all the stuff I couldn't control not important. And they forced me to bring myself to the things I could control. So for me, I was 27 when I got the job at Chestnut Hill. I didn't know you needed a great turf field. I was just excited that I had a team that had two Brazilians on it, a couple of German boys and a couple of kids from South Jersey, a boy from Ireland. I was just mm. excited by the opportunity to kind of learn all that stuff. Um, and I think there's a part of me as a coach that is just always excited about the opportunity. So whether it's a U12 team or a U9 girls team or an over 30 men's team, and I've coached all those levels through, it's the excitement to kind of figure something out with a group of people mm -hmm. that pulls that out of me. So it's never been some of the coaches I love the most are the coaches where so like Bobby Clark, who was a Notre Dame, right? Um, when you talk to players that have come from Notre Dame consistently, they talk about their relationship with him. Now that doesn't, that seems like a fairly trivial thing, but if you look across the landscape of college soccer, it's very transactional. Yeah. So kids get really excited during the recruiting process and then they get there and maybe it doesn't live up to the experiences. And it's always a, what have you done for me lately? Mm -hmm. I keep an eye out always for programs where kids are going, Hey, coach came to my wedding or, Hey, I was a shitty little human being at 17 and that coach cut me, but I still reach out to him because they actually built a relationship, right? Um, coming, so I went to boarding school in South Africa for my education there. My coach was also my housemaster, was also my chemistry teacher. So because they had that 360 about you, it wasn't one element of your life that defined who you were. Mm. So you could have had a really bad math class, but then you have to go do a community service project and your teacher's there, but now they're in a role as your mentor. But then you have rugby practice later. And in that rugby session, you crush it. So when the day ends, you've been able to be all these different versions of you. 
And that's always what I've been fascinated. So some of that is bled into how I coach. And you, you know, you knew this at Chestnut Hill. If you didn't go to class, I threw you off the team. If you were late to practice, I threw you out of practice. If you wore the wrong equipment, I threw you out. Because I was just trying to hammer on the point that the way you do one thing is the way you do everything. Mm. So if the teachable moment is off the field, well, let's go get that W there. Because maybe let's, we can translate that over into what we do on the field. Does that make sense? Yeah. I, I, I'm curious about the, the piece there where you speak about when you were in boarding school, how you kind of had that multifaceted relationship with you know, whether it be other members of your staff but or, or teachers or mentors, coaches. But also I feel like almost that has maybe bled into a little bit of now the way you approach your life because I think what's always been interesting to me about you is like you've never really just kind of pursued the game just in and of itself, right? A lot of coaches, that's kind of where they find their lane and, and I'm a coach and this is what I do. But you've always been really a big com- big proponent of I'm also – you know, studying at the same time, also getting my education. I'm also working in a completely different field as well. Like even to this day, you know, you have this kind of job that is very separate from coaching and then you also coach as well. And has that always been something that you've been conscious of is like, I want to be this very well-rounded multifaceted individual, or has it just been something that you've had interest in multiple different realms and said, Hey, I can, I think I can do these both at the same time. I think if I'm being really honest, it's one of those things where the story only makes sense looking backwards. <laughs> so you heard that expression, like the story yeah. of my life only makes sense if you look backwards in each individual moment, I could go left, I could go right, right? Yeah. Um, I think what I've always been very good at, I'm not a very, well, I'm not going to do, I, I'm not an inherently very intelligent person, but I always listen. So whenever I talk to coaches that were in their 70s, so like Coach Lincoln Phillips, who was the head coach at Howard, which is a historically black college, who was the first black coach to win a national title in soccer, Coach is in his mid-70s now, and he's still out there coaching, firing balls at like kids, and like he's got two artificial hips, but he's just in there, just deep yeah. in there. And I remember sitting down with him, I think I was 28, 29. And he goes, you know what, Zach? If I could do it all over again, I'd still do it. But I'd also make a little bit more money, right? Now, in my 20s, I didn't think about money at all. If I had enough to grab a meal, put gas in the car, and get from one training session to the other, it was a good day, right? But the moment he said that, I was like, huh. Well, I know I always wanted to have a family, right? So then pull out a blank piece of paper and just start doing the math. How many training sessions do I need to run to be able to have a family? Well, if I want to have a family, I want to be able to spend time with them. And then that necessitated me going back to work full-time in pharmaceuticals because I was like, well, I do have a Drexel degree, right? I do have an MBA. So like along the way, people gave me advice and I just always listened. Um, in my early 20s, one of my mentors told me, because I was asking him how to get into business, and he goes, just read a bunch of biographies, right? Because you don't have to live all these lives. You can just read about them. So mm. this guy was a fantastic billionaire, but his marriage fell apart. Or this guy's marriage fell apart, but he was able to get it back together. And then in his 60s, he's now a doctor. And that kind of aligned with a really cool thing about living in America. And for a lot of people who've come to America as adults, I don't think Americans realize how special it is to live in a place where it's perfectly rational for somebody to go to college and go, I want to be a philosophy major and then turn around and go to medical school and then turn around and go be a mechanic. Mm -hmm. And then turn around and and the moment that realization hit me that you can do all these things to answer your question directly, my brain then became, okay, well, there's 24 hours in a day. You need eight of them to sleep. So what's going to limit you, particularly living in America, is how you balance the things that are important to you. So 
Um, and this is a book I'd recommend if you haven't read it. There's a book called The Messiah Way that talks about how the Messiah program recruits players. Actually, this ties back as well to the college process. They don't just look for students and they don't just look for athletes. They look for both and. So the mistake I made in my 20s, I thought it was an either or. Mm. Either you're an elite coach or you're a civilian. Mm. The more people I met that were both and, and the more conversations I had, the more I started sitting there thinking, hmm, if I just gave up a little bit of sleep, right? If I just drove a little bit further, if I just worked a little bit harder, I could have multiple careers. Hmm. So most of my 20s was working on the bench as a scientist and coaching as a soccer coach. Most of my 30s is going to be raising my family, working in business operations, kind of working my way towards business strategy and being an assistant coach. In my 40s, there's a good chance I'm going to be a clinical therapist. In my 50s, I'll be something else because hopefully by that time, my kids are out of the house, right? But it's, it's that reality that you have a life. The mm. time will pass whether you do something with it or not, right? Like you and I are going to have a wonderful conversation about everything and nothing like we always do. And you look up and two hours have gone. Yeah. If during those two hours you felt a good vibe, it doesn't even matter what we talked about. It's just like, listen, the vibes were good. Life was good. We just kept it pushing, right? Um, and that's how I've always approached things is let me ask, let me listen, let me read, let me have a chat. I don't think any one person is just one thing. Because even when you look at the most successful coaches in the world, now, there's a slight caveat here, right? There are people in professions who are just that one thing. Mm -hmm. Like those are like the SAS of whatever profession they're in. But even when you look at the military, the SEALs only make up a really, really small percentage. I knew that I was never going to be in the 5% of any profession that I had. But the next tier allows you to do multiple things. So that's that's sort of where I've landed, right? It's Yeah. Um, and then also, to be fair, COVID kind of helped out with this, right? Like you realize being locked up in a house that you make time, right? Because for the first time, we all had to sit still. It's like, well, what makes me happy? Jumping in a chat like this. This may be the worst podcast you've ever put out there. But we got to have a chat. So for yeah. me, somewhere in my day, I made time to talk to somebody that I care about. And today was a good day. And I'll still be up at four o'clock tomorrow morning to get ready for work because I've made time for that, right? So that both and piece from the Messiah book is something that stays in the back of my mind now whenever I'm confronted with something. It's the same way whenever you hit an obstacle and you ask for advice, Instead of making a trade-off, I go, okay, well, how do we make it work? Yeah. Do you need to pick up a part-time job? Do you need to get on a plane and go to Australia? Do you need to come home for a little bit and figure it out? Okay, let's, let's find a way to keep as many doors open. Knowing worst case scenario, we can just jump out of a window. Or failing that, pick up a hammer, break down a wall, and just keep going. But yeah. find a way. Yeah, I think it's whether it was – you know, kind of whether you laid the groundwork for that for me or whether it's just always been something that I've kind of desired to do as well. I think it's been something that I, I think I've always, whenever I, I feel like whenever I call you, right, there's, I think there's very few times where, especially if we haven't spoken in a while where you're like, yeah, I'm just kind of, I'm kind of doing the same thing. I'm kind of humming along here. Like there's always kind of something new that you maybe have on your horizon. Like, and even if you just speak about it there, right, how you say, you know, maybe by the time that I'm, because it's something we've spoken about, maybe by the time I'm 40, I'm a clinical psychologist, like you've spoken about going back to school to, to go and get your psychology degree. So there's always kind of something that you have that you're kind of bolting on and adding to your repertoire. And I think that was something that was really key for me to learn and also really put into practice was understanding like, to be a footballer, whether if that was my goal, you know, at the time when I was 22, 23, there's still so much time in the day to do other things and it's not going to take away from what your main goal is. Right. And so for you at certain times, you realized if my main goal is to become a coach at whatever level, 
there's still this other time in the day that I can, you know, focus on business, focus on education, focus on whatever the case may be. And yeah, I think it's been really fascinating to, and it also allows you to evolve into many different roles as you, as you grow in your career and just as a person. And I think, I know I can say this as well, and I imagine you can probably attest to this too. I think it affected who I was as a coach too. Like I know I've said this to you multiple times. When I first started coaching under you, I am almost a complete 180 different coach now <laughs> than I am when I started with you because there's just, I've learned so much. I've learned so much shit that I thought was so important <laughs> when I was coaching under you is really not. And I don't need to take it so serious. And yeah. I don't know. I imagine you can attest to that a little bit as well, that, that life outside of football has maybe impacted the way that you approach the game as well. Yeah. I think the coolest thing is I look, so I'm 35 now, right? A lot of the guys that I started working for when I came out of college were around my age now. Most of them have kids and something beautiful happened when they had children, right? The, we were all the same. It was like a, there's a group of like 10 of us on a group thread and it was like, yo, D1, D1 coach, D1 coach, D1. Like we were all D1, D1, D1. Yeah. The funny thing, when you look at that group of 10 people now, four of them are D1 coaches, three of them are DOC, so director of coaching at youth clubs. Um, two of us are out of coaching entirely. One's in the military. He's on his way to becoming a four-star general. Um, I'm working farmer. But that same drive has just found other things. Mm. And there's a uniquely narcissistic, bit that you need when you're in your 20s and it's just me 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 but you shouldn't necessarily be the same person at 30 yeah because it would negate all the interesting things that should have happened along the way right so your worldview should get a little bit bigger um and this is why to the conversation we're having earlier like if you only look at yourself as a coach, you rob yourself of the opportunity for the growth that you're experiencing away from the field to come in and make an impact on the players that you have. Mm -hmm. Right. So I was at Chestnut Hill for four, almost four years. I think I was there 17 through 20. And I remember at the end of the 2020 season, which was affected by COVID. So we didn't have a season. I think I remember, I can't remember whether I was talking to you. Or I was talking to one of the other boys. I go, I think I've reached the end of everything I know how to teach. Right? I need to go I need to go experience some life so I can come back and have some conversations, right? Um and this was on it, I just had that feeling like I need to go experience some life cuz like mm. in all honesty, what does a 28-year-old coach know about life? <laughs> right? You're limited to the scope of what you know. Yeah. But run into me at 37, 38. I've had some losses. I've won some things. I have a lot more kindness in me for that 17-year-old. I also have a sense of urgency for that 17-year-old. So you're going to get both, right? There's going to be more range that I can coach because now that kid could have been my kid. And the older you get and you have your own kids, you now start looking at other kids going, oh, now I have a responsibility to that person who mm -hmm. happens to play my sport. And I think that's, that's growth, right? I think that's what's happening to you as a coach, not that you have any kids. You know, I wouldn't put you out here on the podcast. Number he doesn't have kids <laughs> that we acknowledge. Um, <laughs> no, like the experiences you've had, like, have made you a better person. And that this is a conversation we should, we would always have whenever you talked about going to play overseas. And for you at 23, 24, it was like soccer, 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 soccer. I go, yeah, get your passport stamps in. Yep. Go to Australia, go down under, like go to England, go to, because in your thirties, it won't be soccer anymore. It's, Hey, I have this friend in Germany that I can call. I have this friend in Brazil that I can call and life happens as you're pursuing this thing. And all you have to do is just open yourself just a little bit. 
to the possibility of what's happening around you. Mm. And all of a sudden, life shapes you, right? And that's that's a really cool thing because I've met and I've listened to a bunch of the podcasts you've had. I've met a lot of kids who get to the end of their career and it turns out they thought they had a personality. Mm. But if you remove the sport away, they don't have an identity anymore because it was in reference to all these things. I have a season coming up. I have trials coming up. I have a new coach coming in. I'm recovering from an injury. And you wait, how much are you generating of the life you're living? How much are you generating intrinsically? Yeah. Versus how much of it has been set up around you. And sometimes that can lead you to a very helpless place where it's yeah. like, well, when all these things go away, who am I? What do I do with my time? Where do I go? And I've, I've had assistants, I've had former players where you just sit down and they're like, coach, uh, <laughs> right? What, what, what do I do, right? Yeah. Um, Tal is who you played with while yep. you were at, at Chestnut Hill. Um, Talis was a Brazilian player who was our captain when we were at Chestnut Hill. Fantastic human being. Mm -hmm. Towards the end of his time, he sat down in my office. He was like, I, didn't, I don't enjoy soccer anymore. Which, unfortunately, is a conversation I've heard a lot of players who are beasts, absolute yeah. monsters. Just be like, coach, I don't, I don't enjoy it anymore. And what was cool about our conversation is we flipped it. We go, okay, well, Find something else in what we do that brings you joy. And that was, I gave him that challenge for two weeks. Find something in what we do that brings you joy. Turned out he loved just shooting the shit with the boys. Mm -hmm. So every day I'd be like, all right, let's put 10 minutes in your day where you just show up to training, show up early. Don't worry about the exercise we're going to do. Just go shoot the shit with someone. For some people it was like, hey, I, I really love coaching all right, let's find some little people around you and you teach them. Um, I talked to Tales a couple of weeks ago. He just interviewed the former Brazilian national team coach Yeah, on his own podcast. Like, right? This is somebody who at the time seemed like he was going to go away from the sport entirely. And, he came and all it took was a little perspective change. Yeah. Right? Just, just even in what you do, just a little, hey, I've been looking like this. Let me look here. Let me look here. Growth. And it's the same thing you've experienced. I think what you'll see, and the reason I wanted to be in episode 100, other than the flex, to be like, yo, you know, I was in episode 100. You don't know what time it is. <laughs> is you can, <laughs> see, I mean, listen, superstar treatment. You can go back and listen to each episode and actually hear yourself grow. Yeah. Because, you know, your first 15 episodes were all about you being a soccer player. Yep. And I guarantee you the last 15 episodes haven't necessarily all been about soccer, right? Like we've been on this call for a little bit. I don't think we've talked about soccer for more than just tangentially kind of popped in and like dipped out, right? Yeah. Episode 1000, when I come back, we might not even be talking about sports at all, but the lessons are universal, right? And they kind of flow together. So... Yeah. Yeah, man, there's there's so much that I, I, I want to unpack from that just there. One, just a, a the quick note about our, our captain at the time was, I think what's so interesting about that story for me, especially looking back on it, is that I think there's so many coaches out there, and I know so many coaches that would have looked at that conversation and would have said, oh, my captain's not in it anymore, you know? Like we have to, we have to find somebody to replace him or maybe we have to kind of put him to the side a little bit. Cause he's not, he's not in it as much as we are. And I think you recognize that moment for what it was, that it was way bigger than just whatever happened on the field. And we're like, I remember you said to me, you told me about that conversation. And the first thing you had said, I think was like, that's okay. I understand. Like, and I don't think a lot of people would have had that same reaction, especially in that role right? To have somebody that's that important, you know, to what happens on the field, the results to have them say, listen, I'm not really having fun with this anymore. But it, I do love the piece now that has seen him kind of come back to the game a little bit 
he took the time away and now he's involved in it in a different way. And so that's really cool for me to see as well. But just to, to kind of further explain the point of what you were speaking about with the identity piece, I know I've probably said this time and time again on the show and people are probably sick of hearing it, but it's been the biggest piece of growth, I think, for me so far in my playing career has been starting to not tie my identity so much into the game because you, you speak about that and it is a really common thing that there are so many players out there that they feel like just from a day-to-day perspective, my day is structured out based on what I do and, and all of that's really given to them as well by their club, right? Hey, you show up here. This is when you do physio. This is when you do gym. This is when you eat. This is when you train. This is when you go home. And you start to have that schedule for years and years on top of that associated with everyone that comes up to you, asks you about how football is going. All you care about is how your results are, how you played this last week, what's your club situation for next year, all those types of things. So much of it gets tied up into what happens on the field. I know for me, what kind of caused me to break at certain points was I was like, all right, well, for the past two months, I've played like absolute dog shit. So if my whole identity (laughs) is tied into what I do and I'm playing like dog shit, does that mean that, you know what I mean? So it was hugely important for me to almost disassociate from the game to a certain aspect and, and decide, Hey, this is something that I do, but it is not who I am. And I remember there's so many things that you've told me through the years that I, I definitely think about a lot, but I think one of the biggest things I remember, and I still think about it to this day, I don't remember what call it was on. Is you told me, you said something along the lines of like, I don't know if it was, you were having a conversation with somebody else, but you're like one of the most important things that you had learned was like the game can't love you back. And I, that has stuck with me for so long because <laughs> it's like, it's so true. You know, like I've poured so much into it. And you think about, if you really think about where the love has come from, it's come from the people that were involved in the game. The game is just two posts and some white lines and a ball. That's all it is. There's no emotion that's tied within that relationship. So it's like you can give so much to it. And so I always, I find it kind of an interesting dynamic when people talk about like, oh, the game has given me so much. The game has given me so much. And it's like, I, I understand that, but at the same time, it utterly confuses me, right? Because I look at it more of like the game, I guess, brought me, for example, a person like you, who's now this Mm -hmm. very integral part of my life. So it's like, do I credit that to the game or do I credit that to you, right? So I don't know, I I think it's an interesting point that you bring up just about the identity piece of it and how while you mentioned when you're maybe early on in your career, maybe early on in your twenties and you feel so singularly focused, you think anytime I take a distraction away from that is going to take away from my ability on the field. You start to realize the more that you do actually kind of disassociate, it can help you on the field, which is uh, a hard lesson for me to learn, but one that I think was necessary. Yeah, and like, listen, I'll just slightly evolve that. You might have found me in a jaded moment where I'm like, yo, this game don't love nobody, right? (laughs) Um, The purest version of love does not require being loved back. So a lot of people get jaded because like, well, I've given all of this to the game and the game hasn't given me anything back. Yeah. The reality is the game's giving you stuff back. It might just not be the thing you think is important right now. So in that moment with Tales, I was echoing a conversation I'd had with my dad at three o'clock in the morning while I was an engineering student, thinking I failed at life because I had a statistics exam. And like I came from a household where you're expected to be excellent. And I was on the phone crying to my dad. My dad's like, okay, if you're not happy, go do something else. I was like, wait. Who what? <laughs> who the fuck are you and what have you done with my dad? Like, there's this possibility that I can just go do things that make me happy? I was 24 at the time. But it was the first time I'd ever heard somebody go, yeah, okay. And I, that was, I started separating the things I accomplished from how my dad felt about me. Mm. And we talk about love a lot, right? I tell you guys all the time that I love you dearly. 
I do actually mean it in a textbook sense that I love you guys dearly, but I mean it in the broader sense of my responsibility to, to you. Sometimes loving somebody means you have to be on them. Sometimes loving someone means you've got to kind of give them room to grow. I love Tyler's dearly. And in that moment, he just needed to hear the same thing I needed to hear seven, eight years before. It's like, okay. Because I can understand how hard it is for you to reach that realization. And what made Tyler's really special was not only was he introspective, but he was a very deep thinker. So by the time he's come up and said, hey, I don't love this anymore, he's not just saying it. Yeah. He's felt it. He's, and we could, we've had that conversation as coaches where, hey, he, he feels heavy, right? Like something's going on. And I'd always tell you guys, my door's open because you might need to pop in and have a chat about your grandma or your goldfish. or, But all these things tie together, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think what was really cool, one, I've never taken for granted that you guys allow me to be a part of your life. Like, I think that's the coolest privilege about what I get to do is I get to be a piece of people's life, but also that we get to a point where we can have really interesting conversations, right? Where like, okay, the love I'm showing you right now might just be, Hey, fucking get over it right? You've put your ego here and you need mm-hmm. to be here. But it's, 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 it's that full, right? It's that full 360 feeling. And what I love about the game, and this is a direct answer to your question earlier, whether you credit the game, I'm always grateful for the things the game has given me because it's created mm-hmm. opportunities for me to live in different countries where I can rock up somewhere, roll a ball out, and I'll meet some people. And my geography skills are trash. But because I know multiple teams at Arsenal's played all the way through Europe, my geography of Europe is pretty good. Arsene Wenger for a while signed a lot of international players. My South American geography is pretty good. Not because I was paying attention in school, which I should have been, but just because I, I know where Chile is, I know where Argentina is, I've now coached players for those countries. And I think we also had this conversation where I always tell people, you need to carry the 13 year old version with, of you with mm. you all the time. Yeah. Cause that kid, if you told that kid that what you're doing now was even a possibility. Yeah. They'll freak out. They'll freak yeah. out. I remember I was, I was coaching a goalkeeping camp with like 25 goalkeepers in July in rural Virginia for three hours between 11 a.m. and 1 p.m. and all of them were under the age of eight. (laughs) And I could have been hating my life, but I had a bag of balls and these kids were some just awesome. And they didn't care how hot it was. They were just excited to be outside. And I remember I was about to start bitching about it. And I was like, dude, I'm getting... One, I'm getting paid to do this. But two, I have a bag of balls. I have a bunch of kids who are really excited to figure this stuff out. And you reach for gratitude and suddenly your perspective changes. Yeah. And that's why I say, like, my love for the game has become new. It's the same way your love for a person would be. You start dating and it's all, you know, it's all consuming. It's like an inferno that's going to burn everything around it, right? Mm-hmm. You're going to be on the phone for six hours. They're all you think about you. And then it evolves, right? It becomes more of a partnership. It becomes deeper. It becomes, and that's the same way my relationship with the game has been. It used to be just about, did Arsenal win this weekend? Mm -hmm. That was it. It's all I cared about. That guy's trash. Don't sign that guy. Fire that guy. Get that guy. And then I started coaching. I was like, oh, okay. My German left back and my German English midfielder, (laughs) actually get along right or a kid like tj who's one of my favorite human beings in the world just figuring out what position he actually plays right Mm -hmm. or even players that have butted headwards like i'm always grateful for the time that i spent with jason doherty because it forced me to grow right if it forced me to kind of sit there and go okay i know what that kid is going through 
how can I help that kid for while he's here, but also how can I learn from this moment, right? And that is, that is why I say I'm still in love with the game. I don't expect anything back. Mm. But it's the same way going back to our earlier conversation with you and your mom. Your mom loves you dearly. She doesn't expect anything back. And like that's, that's the level of love you're trying to get to, right? It's the same thing about a game. Like the more you get to know it, the more you get to know the people, the deeper you – like I don't have a team anymore because Arsenal stabbed Arsene Wenger in the back and I'm still the only person protesting that decision. <laughs> but now you put a great Amazon Prime documentary on and I'm on. Yeah. I've jumped from Tottenham to Leeds to Manchester City because you get to see the human beings on the other side of the score lines and you're in, right? Mm-hmm. I was supporting France in the World Cup final, but there was a little piece of me that was like, oh, this would be great for Messi. Yeah. Just because like you, you, you'd you seen the documentaries and it's like, man, this would for this person, this would be great. And then for McAllister to play for Brighton and then to be at those things are the things that have always moved me, but more so now that I'm a little bit older and I, you know, I, I've seen more people. So, for example, there's a kid called CJ Dos Santos, right? Mm-hmm. I knew CJ when he was 12. CJ is one of the backup goalkeepers now for Inter Miami. When I watch an Inter Miami game, if he comes on, I'm not watching the game anymore. Yeah. Right? I'm watching a kid from here play and I know his dad and I'm excited and there's love there, right? Brennan Aronson. I would like when I was coming out of college, Brennan Aronson, I think, was maybe 10, 8, 9 around there, and I was watching him play a YSC. And this kid's head was like this, <laughs> just scanning, just everywhere he went, just scanning. Sc- and you could watch the game and go, okay, that one's different. Now, full disclosure, I've been more wrong about players, and Brendan will tell you all the success <laughs> I've had has been because my assistants are geniuses. But <laughs> You could just you could just see just scanning, and now he's playing for Leeds United. Yeah, right. So like some of that experience, because again, I've been guilty like most coaches of going, "Hey, that kid is shit." Translate that a little bit. Pull all the bullshit away. Pull mm. all the ego away, and it's like that kid maybe wasn't taught something that they need to be able to do for me to coach them. So if I say a kid is shit, all I'm acknowledging is I'm not the coach for them. And the moment I flip that on my head, because you and I know, right? Like you've had coaches where you're like this and you've had coaches where you're like this. Yep. But sometimes the coaches where you're like this at the right age, you needed that, you needed yeah. that thing to measure yourself against. You needed to run into a wall and go, okay, I'm not fragile. Let me keep going. Mm-hmm. And sometimes you need, so think we were talking earlier about philosophies i've realized now that what hinders a lot of college programs is people are not very good at building a coaching staff so if you have a staff full of people like me you might never win anything because we'll always prioritize a person over the end result you need a balance right and i think that's what I took away from my time at Chestnut Hill and other programs that I've been. Go, hey, when I was on a really good staff and it was, we were all simpatico, we all believed in the same end goal and we just all kind of built off of each other, we were flying. Mm. The moment mm. ego started to come in and we lost focus on what we were trying to do, then it all falls apart. So I don't know where I was going with that answer, but kind of. No, I, I, in, in you kind of speaking there, it made me think, and I wonder if you feel this same way as well, that I think my, I think for me, I've become kind of so empathetic, understanding like my situation, other people's situations, I've become so empathetic to all players. It's almost made me, I can't really be a fan of the game in the traditional sense anymore, I guess, if that makes sense, right? In the same way that like people can watch the game and watch somebody and be like, oh, he's shit, he's terrible, blah, blah, blah. And this player's at the top level. Like, I can't do that anymore because it's either one of two things. It's either one, I look at it and I'm like, do you understand the percentile of 
of the player that this person falls into to even be on this field right now, one. And two, it's like, you have no idea what's going on behind the scenes, what's going on at home, what's going on at training every day for this player. Like, you have no idea why. He could be playing like this or he could not be playing like this. And so, I don't know, it's it's really, like I said, we've talked a lot about kind of evolution and, and kind of growth within the game. And I think that's been something for me that I've started to notice. Like, I, I can't really... I can't look at the game the same way that I used to. And I can't just be so definitive with the evaluation of a player or, or, or whatever. Um, I wonder if that's kind of the same sentiment maybe that you feel as well that you've experienced in coaching. But it seems like you've had that from a very early stage, even in your career. Yeah. I, I was trying, I'm trying to remember who told me this. I don't know if it's in the Bible, but somebody told me this, so we're going to say it's in the Bible. I don't think it is. It might be a, like a rap lyric from somewhere. <laughs> um, there's three ways to say it. One way is what God has set aside for you is yours and yours alone. So if you're successful, that was for you. It was like what's mine is mine or what's yours is yours, right? Mm. The other way to say it is that if I have a candle – and you have a candle, and my candle has a flame on it, and I go over and I light your candle, my candle is not lessened by lighting yours. Yeah. Right? So, like, it's, it's, that, it's that sense of... Oh, and then the third way is, like, I'm only trying to be the best version of me. I'm not trying to be a good Brendan Griffiths. Uh, I was going to say, that was probably the rap lyric one because the first two were definitely some whack-ass rap lyrics. <laughs> <my dude. laughs> no, but like, it's it's that. So like recently, BJ Callahan just got named the interim head coach of the U.S. men's national team, right? Mm -hmm. And everybody's losing their mind and like there's articles and this yeah. this guy qualify and all this other rubbish that goes on bj was one of the goalkeeper coaches at the philadelphia union's ysc academy and he gave me my start and i guarantee you there isn't a human being alive that cares more for what that national team jersey means and there's no human being who's going to outwork him. Now, there's other stuff to consider and all that other rubbish, but that's all I care about. Yeah, I just need to know that that guy is going to give everything he can, and if he's not capable anymore, he'll move on. Right? And he'll be the first person to put his hand up and go, yo, nah. <laughs> right? This, this is it. This isn't for me anymore. And for me, it's, it's those stories that I – like, there's a – Oh, what's that website that um, Derek Jeter and them started? The Players' Tribune. Mm. You want to quickly lose whatever bullshit opinion you have about a human being? Mm -hmm. Go read those articles. Like when Cleberson wrote about his life or when um, Ronaldinho wrote about his life or when Kaká wrote about his life, you just... Again, it's easy to forget that these are people, right? And some, some of that is the escapism of sports. It's very easy to pop up every day and be like, yo, Jordan versus LeBron. LeBron is trash. Blah, 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 blah. I guarantee you, I guarantee you, if you spend 15 minutes actually just talking to the human being LeBron James, you'd come away completely different. View. Yeah. You'd actually be a fan because now you, you have something that you can empathize with. So... I still watch football as a fan, but I don't carry <laughs> I don't yeah, carry any of that baggage. Like my ego yeah, like my ego isn't tied in anymore in, in being right that that guy's shit. Right? Yeah. I might be like, yeah, that guy's loose. No, I say loose more often than I say shit. I go, yo, that touch is loose. <laughs> you know? And cause just in the context of where you're playing, that touch is a little loose, my guy. You know, that ball rolled away, you know, tighten yeah. that up. Yeah. Cause I think um, it's, I think it's, yeah. it's something that we, I think have in common and especially hearing the way that you speak about it is I have a real fascination for story more so than anything else. Right. It's why this is such a, a cool outlet for me. It's why, as you said, I'm the same way. Like, I don't care 
what the team is. You give me like a second division team from Bulgaria and it's, it's the documentary of following their season. Like I'm in, I want to know, I want to know the story more so than I really do. Even at this point, you know, what happens on the pitch and, and, and even that part of it is just, there's like some saying I heard from somewhere, like everything's just for the plot, right? Like that's, that's kind of the way that I look at it now more is like the games are just pieces of the plot line more so than, you know, 90 minutes of like, here's what the result is. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's like story is such a, a powerful, powerful thing, I think. Yeah. And sports is one of the most beautiful way to like the Olympics. Dude, some of the stories that those Olympic at like, you yeah. just sit there and you go, Jesus, I am four sleeves deep into some Oreos right now, drinking <laughs> and laying on my sofa. And this guy basically had to climb backwards down a mountain full of glass shards just to be here to finish in 15th place. Mm-hmm. And I'm sitting here saying, this guy's trash. Yeah. Right? Like, the endless... Like the the endless beauty of the human soul, especially in pursuit of really hard things, and maybe this is part of my coaching philosophy, right? Like, go pursue really hard things. Yeah. And along the way, you'll learn more about yourself. I think I've used this metaphor with you. I always forget because I always black out when I tell you guys stuff on the field, right? But I'd always tell you guys, especially in the winter sessions, that if you go run a marathon, you get like 30 seconds, maybe 15 seconds at the finish line to be like, woo, finished. Then immediately you look at your watch being like, hey, I could have run faster. I could have pushed myself harder. Yep. You spend so much more time in the preparation. So if you look at your life the same way, right, learn to love the process. Right? Like learn to love those hours in the gym. And now, Loving it, again, doesn't mean it's going to be comfortable, Mm. right? But falling in love with it allows you to to kind of embed yourself in those little nuances of it. And sports then allows you to tell that story, yeah, right? So that single mom who is a curling world champion who has to work at Kmart to make ends meet. But when that Olympic light comes on her every four years and she's, she's going to be out there You know, I watch some of the most random sports in the Olympics now that I'm thinking about it. But again, it's a story. You're flicking channels and suddenly they go, and this bobsled team from Jamaica. I'm in. It's all I need. I don't need any more. I'm just, I'm in. I don't care. I'm in. Yeah. Right? Um, And I think as a coach, part of what you equip your players with is the ability to tell their own story. Some of them will do it on the field. Some of them will leverage the experiences they're having now with you to help somebody else down the road. But it's very empowering to understand that you are the main character in your story. Mm. Again, another cheesy thing. I think I read on the back of a car somewhere where it's like, if you don't like the story, just yell plot twist. And go <laughs> in the opposite direction. <laughs> like, let's see, you're having a shitty day. Just get up and go plot twist and just go that way and then just see what, because again, you're the main character in your own story. So yeah, like, enjoy it, right? It's the same thing with football. Like I went over to visit the missus and I went to watch um, Liverpool play West Ham. I was just so excited to be in Anfield. Like I was just so excited to be there. This is a place I just watched on TV. Yeah, And there's a guy, like a season ticket holder next to me, who's just laying into Trent Alexander-Arnold. Absolutely giving it. <laughs> but we both had a good experience. <laughs> yeah. Right? His is different to mine. I'd gone to this cathedral of football, and I was just there in awe. He, he goes to that game every week, and he's just Trent. You Same, yep. it's just in him. Just in him. <laughs> and the sport is big enough to con- to contain all of those things, right? Um, and again, it goes back to storytelling. Like, what is a story? How does that expression go? There's a story people tell themselves about you. There's a story you tell yourself about yourself. Then there's a story the world tells you about mm. you. 
right? And you always want to be careful which one of those stories becomes a guiding narrative for yourself. So again, in that game, I was there purely as somebody who was a fan of football. Yep. He was there as a season ticket holder who's had a season ticket since the 80s. And this right back is just fucking it up. And like he needs to be taught, hey, you're shit. Now, all of us know, if somebody showed up to your work and started yelling, you're shit. Your performance is not going to get better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, that, that, that's just, hey, that's the movie he's in. I'm in a completely different movie, but we're in the same space, right? Has it always been something, you mentioned there, that, that idea of always pursuing kind of hard and challenging things. Has that always been something that you have sought out from your life and the things that you choose to pursue and in, in choosing things that are going to continue to challenge you and test you? Or has it always been kind of falling into a space where you feel some passion or you feel some, some spark about what that specific uh, endeavor kind of brings to you? Uh, so a little bit of both. So in my early twenties, like any good African child, I was just terrified of disappointing my parents. Mm -hmm. So m most of everything I did from zero to 25 was just to make them proud. Right. And then living in the U S when I got my green card was the first time I realized that I had agency in the life that I led, which again, seems like a very arbitrary thing. But just like I said, you just yell plot twist and you go left. Yep. If you don't know that you have the power to do that, the moment you realize it, it shifts how you look at yourself. Again, the story you tell yourself. But it also shifts the world because every conversation is now filled with endless possibilities. That person you run into the corner might be the CEO of a Fortune 500 company. Or they might be a crackhead. <laughs> Let's find out. Right. <laughs> but be fully engaged in that conversation. So for me, I, I always say do difficult things. And what I always mean is the things that have been the most rewarding for me have always been the things that are laced with a little bit of um, insecurity. There's a little bit of a feeling of, you know, I don't belong here. Mm. For everything that's been deeply rewarding, there's been that little bit of fear. My first instinct is to pull away. And that's where I go, ooh, yep, I'm in the right place, right? Let me deal with all my own bullshit that I drag along with me, right? Imposter syndrome, insecurity, I'm not going to work harder. All right, Chestnut Hill exercise, that's where it came from, right? Everything I did with you guys is just stuff I did for myself. All right, let's create this box. Let's put all this shit in here. We acknowledge that it exists. Yep. We're going to put it over here. We'll unpack it. Now let's get after it. Right. So, and I, I always have like the difficult thing today might just be getting out of bed. And that might just, that, just that, just get your ass out of bed. Well, the difficult thing might be to close on a multi million dollar contract, or it might be go for a jog, or it might be, but on the other side of that attempt, that full throwing yourself at it is growth, is that stretching of yourself, is that feeling of, Ooh, I think I had it. And sometimes you just take an L. Let's, let's keep it a buck. Sometimes you just go out of there. I was helping coach at Goldie Beacon. We were 0-16 and 2 this fall. We took mad L's. Just L's. Left, right. I've never lost that many games in my life. But if you came and watched our training sessions, you wouldn't know what our record was. And like all this stuff I always preach to you guys about embracing the process. When you're 0 and 14, who you either put Hard up or you shut up. Work. <laughs> yeah, you either put up, but every day I went and said, okay, what can I control? I can love on these kids. We can work hard. We can focus. We can find ways to get better. Let's chase that little percentage. And when that team goes on to be successful, which they will be, it's not that that I'll take gratitude from. It's that I had the opportunity to be there when the seeds were being sown and learn from that. Because now I can replicate that, right? Because you need a bit of luck to win some games. You need some good coaching, fair enough. But like in those difficult moments is where the seed is of your growth is sown. So why I always say choose one difficult thing is it makes you appreciate all the other things. 
So whether you're on that Joe Rogan kick where you're taking ice baths at the start of the morning or you are somebody who goes out and runs 15 miles early in the morning, it reminds you that you're alive, right? Or for you, the hard, I have players where the hard thing is to just to sit and meditate for five minutes. They would rather just go run and be chased by a pack of wolves for three hours, but just to sit by themselves. Or I've had players like recently where they're having mental health challenges and the hard thing is asking for help. Like the hard thing is literally, hey, coach, I need you to go with me to talk to a therapist because this doesn't feel right. Whatever that hard thing is, lean into it because growth is just on the other side, right? So I always say, do the hard thing first because a lot of time your first instinct, like I give you a list of things to do and it's like uh, tidy your room, learn Mandarin, fight a bear you're immediately going to go to tidy your room, right? But if you have to prepare to fight a bear, <laughs> like, yeah, lean into that. You know, maybe, maybe that's the thing that maybe flips the, flips the script. <laughs> but because sometimes if you feel like you're in a rut, find something hard and go do it. And I guarantee you when you come back and you face that problem that had you in a rut, you're going to look at it a little bit. Again, plot twist, right? Yeah. You're going to look at it a little bit different. You're going to frame it a little bit different because you went and actually did something genuinely hard. And again, this is all relative, right? This is all relative to the person who's going through the thing. But yeah, do, do the hard thing. And if you fall on your ass, and this is the beauty of sports, right? You think you're hot shit, and then you come up against a player who's, we always talk about levels, right? You think you're here. And you meet the guy that lives here and he thinks his trash and you have a choice. You either line up every day and you get your ass handed to you and you say, thank you. Can I have some more the next day? Or you run into that and you run away. But if you lean into that, you might never catch it because again, there's levels, right? You might never get past the level you're at, but in pursuing that you're making yourself better. Yeah. And I think that's why I would say, like, find a hard thing, whatever it is, whatever you're avoiding, whatever makes you a little bit uncomfortable, and do the work in that space because the knock-on effect everywhere else, it's like, oh, yeah, like, if I told you you had to fight a bear in 30 seconds, send me that list of, like, do your laundry, buy groceries, and all that seems fucking easy. <laughs> yeah. Right? So sometimes just even introducing the bear into the, into the plot makes all these other things more palatable to do. Yeah, I, I think what's been always interesting to me is I think you've always spoken to me about any player that comes to you and says, hey, I think I want to try and, you know, continue this at the next level, continue to play it, whether that's the professional level, overseas, whatever. There's never been a time where I've heard you say to any player, I don't really think that's a good idea for you. I think you've always had the mindset of like, go and try it because that's the perfect definition of that. That's that challenging thing. It's one of the most challenging things that you can go out and do. Like I even look at my story and I, you know, on paper, it probably didn't make a lot of sense for me coming in and saying that at the end of my season, you know, I, I played some games. We were kind of bang average. I was kind of bang average as well. There was no like, oh man, this guy lit the world on fire. Like, let's go and call all the scouts I know to, to give him an opportunity. But you recognized in that moment that this is probably one of the hardest things that you'll go and do. And it's going to teach you so much rather than really, you know, any specific, what it will actually do for you in terms of playing here, playing there, playing freshly, whatever, just the teaching moment that it will provide is that much more important, that difficult moment that you spoke about. Um, but I am curious as well. And I was wondering if you could help to provide some context to this because it's, a definitely an ulterior motive I have of this show is to kind of shine light on the mental health side of the sport and mental health side of sport in general. And, you know, it's something that I've spoken to a little bit, how much kind of therapy, mental health things have helped me, but is there anything that you can speak to in terms of maybe how many players you really think out there that even you've spoken to and kind of your own, your own crossing um, that really deal with it to a certain extent? Cause maybe that can provide some level of, um, 
understanding for other players out there that maybe feel like they're alone in it. And they're the only ones that think that way. Cause I mean, you and I both know that there are so many players out there that really do experience it. And it's at levels that you would even be shocked to think that they do right. Even at the top, top levels, there's still players that experience those same doubts about their confidence, about things off the field, whatever it may be. Um, I'm just wondering if you can maybe shine some light on this topic as well. Cause I know it's something that's important to you. Yeah. So I'm, um... Before we get really serious, right, I just want to tie off the last piece and just say, um, and this I stole from Jay-Z, this I definitely know I got from Jay-Z, and the quote goes, never ask people who've never left their house for directions on how to go where you need to go, Ah. because all they can give you is all the fears that they've man, like all the stuff that stopped them from leaving the house, that's all they can give you. They can't give you anything else. So sometimes just go and figure it out along the way, which is why for me, if a player says they want to be a pro, cool. What, like, what do I gain by telling you no? Yeah. Other than gratifying my ego and passing my fears on to you. Yeah. Right. Because I look at it the same way my dad did. When I told my dad I wanted to be a coach, he goes, well, that's stupid. But okay, if you can figure it out. That's why you'd always tell us, if you can figure it out and you can pay your bills, good luck. I wish you well. Yeah. Right? So I just wanted to tie that little knot, right? Um, I think a counter... There's another way to say that. I think it goes... Oh, this is more for something else. But it's like, don't, don't care about the opinion of people whose advice you'd never seek. Mm. So if you never come to me for advice before you do something, you shouldn't care what my opinion is on the thing you're going to do. Yeah. Right? Um, Shifting, right? Segue. Maybe maybe your editor can cut this to make this look nice and sharp. (laughs) Uh, Plot twist. Um, I think where people get it wrong is they look at mental health as a discipline-specific thing. So, hey, more players are having mental health issues. Hey, more teachers are having more people. More and more people at younger and younger ages are presenting with mental health challenges. And some of that is a very rational response to the way the world is. Right? Like some of these things like being anxious or being depressed is a very rational response to what's going on on Instagram to what's going at home, to what you're seeing on the telly. The skill is in navigating where that's coming from and deciding, right, are you going to carry this with you? So for a lot of players, because it's a sequence of things, right, before I can teach you to be free on the field, if you're carrying this bag, so for a lot of young players I deal with, it's wanting to please their parents. So we all know players where if your dad's in the front row watching you play, you're going to play like trash, right? Because you're seeking that validation that you're doing well. So before I can even start to coach you or teach you anything, I can get 50% more out of you if I just help you untangle that relationship. And it might just be you and your dad having a conversation where your dad goes, hey, I'm proud of you. And maybe that that kind of unweaves some of those things, right? So from a mental health perspective, I've run into a lot of players, and I'm just going to use players and people interchangeably because I don't draw a distinction between, hey, for two hours of your day, you kick a leather ball around, so suddenly you're this category of human being versus the lady that works at Kmart. Mm. The biggest challenge of especially depression, right? So you see a lot of anxiety. Um, and anxiety a lot is, is the fear of what's going to happen is future tripping. And most athletes have some version of that because there's always a tryout. There's always another game. There's always, there's always something in the future. Sometimes you lose yourself in the present. Um, and I stole this from the NFL where be where your feet are. Hmm. So wherever your feet are, be there. Right. And that's something I say to a lot of my players now is like, where are your feet? Your feet are here. Be here. Don't be 15 yards away, like be present where your feet are. The depression one 
becomes dangerous because the biggest trick about depression is it convinces you that you're by yourself. And that's the biggest lie because you're never by yourself. I feel that way, right? This, I've had moments where I'm going through a period where I just feel low and I'm like, but I'm surrounded by people. Right? And there's nothing more dispiriting than being alone in a crowd, right? There's people around you and you just feel disconnected, right? My, my therapy is just to go do something nice for somebody else. And that, that works for me, right? But it could just, hey, let me, I can impact somebody else's happiness so there's a chance I can impact my own. That agency over myself is, is something I find really useful. With a lot of players, we talk about like, most of the players I interact with now are somewhere between 14 and 24. So you're going through a lot of changes, right? You're going from being an absolute beast at U14 to being rubbish at U16 because everybody grew up. Okay, well, what's the story you told yourself about yourself at 14 and you don't fit that story anymore? All right, well, what's the story that fits who you are now? Right, and you and I would always have conversations about your toolkit. So as you grow, your toolkit needs to get bigger. So mm. when you're just a soccer player, being like, "Hey, I'm shit, and I need to work harder," works. But now you've got a significant other at home, and that "I'm shit, I'm shit, let me grind, let me grind, let me grind," <laughs> is not a healthy way to deal with that relationship. So you have to grow, right? And I think when people have these mental health conversations. They like to narrow the scope because it's easier to say, hey, more athletes are having these issues. No, more people are having these issues because they don't always have the right coping mechanism. I guarantee you that in the next 10 years, it's going to be a requirement to have a trained mental health expert on every team because it makes a massive difference. Mm. Just even just, hey, help me reframe this problem. Right, because the voice you hear most throughout your life is your own. So if I spend all this time worrying about all these other things, but I never help you, and because you'll coach yourself better than I can coach you, because you talk to yourself in the middle of it. I could be Brandon, whip that, get around the corner, whip, whip, whip that thing in at the back stick, and in your head, all you're thinking is, "I'm shit, I'm shit, I'm shit, I'm shit, I'm shit." It doesn't matter how loud I am. Mm -hmm. my job and this goes back to why i'm fascinated by people is my job is to help you shift that voice in your head so that even as i'm yelling yo whip that thing at the back stick i've helped you understand the value of that ball so now you can decide now nah, coach i'm gonna cut inside of my left foot i'm gonna whip that thing back stick because i saw it on the scouting report but to get there you have to be playing free in order to access all those things that is the same thing in any other aspect of life. You have Fortune 500 CEOs who face the same anxiety as a basketball player facing Jimmy Butler. You've got to make decisions that have big consequences. Well, how do you deal with them? If your toolkit is still the same one you've had since you were 14, you're fucked. <laughs> right? Like that has to grow. And I think a lot of the mental health that I run into is getting people to acknowledge that growth so that it can en encompass who they are now, mm. but also leave room for them maybe to unpack who they used to be, maybe get new tools to, to help them figure out who they want to be next and kind of make them a little bit of a bigger person in their own mind. But the thing you're tackling is that voice in your head, which is why I always say, the most dangerous thing about depression is the first thing it does is that inner voice goes, you suck. You're wasting everybody's time. It's all about you. And the moment somebody can break that cycle and go, maybe it isn't just me. Plot twist. Right? Um, and a lot of players have that moment where it's very weird. Well, not weird, but like, I've had sessions where I say, hey, you did well. And you go, I fucking sucked today. And you go, okay. You can make that choice. I'm just telling you, objectively, you did well today. <sighs> okay, well, that guy likes to be miserable sometimes. So I leave you be. 
But it's important for me to tell you, hey, I think objectively you did well. You might not be ready to hear me right now, but at least I've planted a counter message to what you're telling yourself in your head. Mm. And I think a lot of mental health on a very simple level is just that. Hey, can we change the radio? Can we change what you're telling yourself, right? Which is why I always say, I don't know if I did this exercise with you or some other guys. I was like, hey, let's put a blank piece of paper down and just write. Get all those thoughts out on paper. And then you can look at them and go, oh, oh, yeah, I don't believe that about myself anymore. Mm -hmm. Progress. Like once it's trapped on paper, you can look at it and go, oh, yeah, I don't, I don't believe. Yeah, that's, I used to think that, <laughs> right? That's something I used to think, but I don't think that anymore. And you free yourself. Well, hey, I didn't even know that this thing is connected to this thing that's connected to this thing. Bringing it back to football, any goal is never one single mistake, right? I'd always tell my goalkeepers this because I'm a card-carrying member of the goalkeepers union. That ball had to get past 10 other assholes before it got in the back of the net. Yeah. If you can get them to do their job, less bad things are going to happen. Right, you know, it's a throw in where somebody didn't mark someone, it's a ball whipped into the back post, nobody's marking the striker. You can find the chain of mistakes, and any one of them you fix stops the goal. It's the same thing with negative thoughts. You have one negative thought and then another negative thought, and all it takes is for somebody to break that chain or to just put a bit of light in some of the dark places we have in our minds that we don't want to go to. And suddenly it doesn't feel so bad and suddenly you don't feel so alone. And that is the first step towards making progress. Mm. Does this make sense? And uh, like, yeah. I was going to say I went off into the weeds, but that's basically what this podcast is probably going to, a trip, a trip into the weeds. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, I guess my follow up to that would be what's, what's the advice that you give to a person who is in that stage where the, there kind of keeps being links added to the chain of negativity, right? Where they are, they're in that space where they feel they can't come and break the chain and kind of shine a little bit of light on it. And they, they keep continuing along the same cycle. And like you said, maybe sometimes when you're feeling depression, there's an element of you feel so isolated and so alone. I remember it's something that you definitely told me that it has this, really funny way of tricking you into thinking that you're by yourself. And so for someone who thinks that they're by themselves and they kind of keep adding on links to that chain of this is who I am. This is what I think about myself. How do they break it and take that first step in towards maybe it's seeking someone else's input to, to helping them. I'll be honest, if I if I if I had a simple answer to that, I'd be minted. Right? Because mm. I'd just borrow it and just sell it to everybody. I think the first step is always for me, is always just write it down. Just write it right like take the train of thoughts you're having, write it down and read it. And a lot of the time you realize I don't actually believe that about myself. It's like so it's Connecting to somebody else might not be an option, right? So finding, because there's always somebody who's willing to listen. It might just not feel that way, but there's somebody who's always willing to listen. And what happens a lot of time is it might not be the first person. It might not be the second person. It might not be the third person. It might not be the fifth person you ask for help. It might be the sixth. But as you're looking for those people to connect with, I, I always just write stuff down. And just literally look at it and go, hey, does this... And the reason I'm always I'm so passionate about stuff like this is I've lost players to suicide. Hmm. And I sit at, you sit at a funeral and you just see this, this wave of love and you just go, man, I wish you could have seen this. But you're also fully aware that that person was experiencing that love but if they didn't allow themselves to, right? It's like you can be in the desert and there's a glass of water 15 feet to your right. Mm -hmm. But if you're only looking left, it does. It could be a fucking gallon of water to your right. Yeah. But if you never look around, you'll never see it. And it took me a really long time to understand that when somebody's depressed, 
when someone is a high, like your reality is what you perceive it to be. And it, it's like, as much as I might want to help you, and this is why I always say, when somebody allows me to help them, I always say, thank you. And they always go, why are you thanking me? I go, well, you gave me the opportunity to be of service. So I either say, write it down or genuinely get up, go do something for somebody who has no way to pay you back, who didn't expect it and can't even say thank you because it, it shows you have agency to shift a mindset. Mm. Might not be your own. You might still need to power up, right? You might be like a little Pokemon over here and you need to level up. And by helping the other person, you show what your capacity is. And don't do it to put it on Instagram. Don't do it because you expect something back. Just go do it because it feels good to help somebody else. And some of that agency comes back to, well, hey, I went and helped Coach Zadok. He was having a really bad day, and I just brought him a cup of coffee, right? And, like, it made him feel better. Well, I did that. I mean, I've been feeling really shitty about this thing that I have. I have this relationship with my aunt. And it's going, I'm just going to write down how I feel about it. Mm. Cool. I've trapped in a piece of paper. That is my difficult thing for today. Right. So again, I'm very um, achievement oriented. So that's why it's like, write it down, go help someone. These are all actions that you can take yeah. on a really, really basic level. Just sit and go, I'm not on my own. I might not yeah. feel that way. I might not feel that way right now. Right. And it's very important to be like, because there's all this jingoism that goes around that feelings are not facts. But it's fucking difficult when you feel like shit. It feels like that is a fact. Yeah. And if that person listening, all you can hold on to is, hey, I'm not on my own. Let that be the difficult thing that you hold on to for today. And then build into the next thing. And it might be a few days, it might be months, it might be years. And all you're holding on to is, I'm not on my own. It's not uniquely me. There's nothing wrong with me. This is just how I feel right now, right? Because I think the difficult thing about answering mental health questions is, this. you know how you have that full wheel of emotions? Mm -hmm. We all just want to live in happy. Well, happy is just a, as transitionary a state as unhappy, right? Like getting too happy is where your actual reward is. And mm -hmm. getting too unhappy is the opportunity you have to make that adjustment so that you kind of swing through that neighborhood. But sometimes just sit in it, right? You've never appreciated being healthy more than when you have a fever of 105 and you can't leave your bed, right? Mm -hmm. But when you're healthy, you never think about being sick. So one of the things I do is just practice gratitude, right? Like, yo, today I go on the call with my boy Brendan. And the views are going to be lit. And I represented the group chat. And it was a good day. Put that down as a win. Yeah. And I put it in the bank. Because one day I might be having a shitty day. And I just need to go back to the bank of all these things I've put in. Just to pull a feeling out of it. Just be like, yo. yeah, My Mama G hoodie pulled in today. Right? I just put my, I put my hoodie on. I feel, I feel good. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I... I I don't want to always say people can do something about it, even though it's something I believe. Because when you when you don't feel like you can, it can be really unfair to say that. So on a base level, I'd say if all you can hold on to is it's not you, because that's the one thing I can tell you is absolute bullshit, is feeling like it's just you. Yeah. Right? All these other things are steps along the ladder towards getting yourself to a place where you feel better about yourself. But the one thing that is absolute bullshit is feeling like it's just you that you are uniquely broken in a way that means you deserve this bad feeling that you're having. That is complete horseshit. So yeah. all you can hold on to is, hey, this is where I am now. It's that old expression, right? If you're going through hell, keep going. Because mm. you'll either be further along or you'll be outside of hell, right? If you just sit there and you cry, you're just going to sit there and cry. Some days you might go two feet. But for goodness sake, just fucking keep going. Because I guarantee you there's somebody in your life that loves you and 
would be absolutely devastated if you did it. Give yeah. them the opportunity to come be of service to you. And even if all that looks like right now is just hold on, right? Just fucking hold on. We're coming, <laughs> mm. right? We're coming. Just, 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 just fucking hold on. Yeah. Don't be like that lady on Titanic who could have kept that guy on the door, but just fucking pushed him into the water. Just fucking <laughs> hold on. Don't do that. Yeah, the just, only way just, is through. Just, you know, just hold on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The only way. Is yeah. Through. Because again, like, it it makes sense on the other side, which sounds like a shitty thing to say to somebody who can't see that there is another side. But on the other side of whatever is going, you're going through. Yeah, there's another side. Just hold on, right? Just hold on. Yeah, it, it's. Uh, I was speaking to my cousin about this recently, also with my therapist about this recently. That it's like the the one thing that I've found so interesting as of late is that you can you can take a step back from the outside and understand that whether it be life or a career is all made up of the ups and downs, right? And you can you can sort of reflect on those times when you felt so low that then that led you into whatever your next high might have been. And you can understand how maybe the lessons that you took from the low led you to the high. Like you can, you can rationalize all those things, but that's only kind of in the post, right? And so even though you, you are very aware of that in a logical and rational sense, in order for you to actually have those ups and the downs, the downs need to feel like they are downs. You can't be in a down and think, oh, well, this is just, you know, this is part of the plot. This is, I understand that this is just for my next high. It's like, no, you need it to feel like <laughs> garbage for it to actually have that high, yeah. right? So like, that's been yeah. something that's been yeah. so fascinating to me is you think because you've therapized yourself or because you've thought through it so well, you understand, oh, this is just, this is just a, a period of time where I'm down. There's an element of you that kind of needs to feel that, oh my God, how am I actually feeling this down in order for you to see the other side of it? Yeah. And I mean, just again, recognize the feeling, right? Find a way to be grateful for the feeling because it's teaching you something and then let it go, right? Like, just like a cloud, like see it, oh, it's a, it's a fucking tsunami, not a tsunami, the thunder cloud. See it, recognize it for the beauty of what lightning and thunder look like. And then just let it go. When the sunny day is there, look at it as well, appreciate it, and then let it go. It's snowing, appreciate it, and then let it go. Because you stay there long enough, <laughs> it'll all circle around again, right? And being present sometimes means being present when things are really shit. It doesn't know it. Being present isn't always pleasant, right? Because it's an adaptive mechanism to run away mentally from shit that's fucked up, right? But within reason, right? Be present. Allow it to wash over you. And maybe as it washes over you, it washes away some things you don't need anymore. Hold on to the things that you know, like the pillars of who you are, but sometimes just just let it come and let it go, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, I know it's We're I know it's that getting woo woo category where I'm the least qualified are. human being to talk about these <laughs> things. But I always tell people I'm a, I'm I'm an enthusiastic amateur. I have no qualifications whatsoever. But every conversation I have with someone that's actually deep and meaningful ends up in these universal truths. Like once you whittle all the bullshit away, right? Like you end up in this space. Like, am I living a good life? What does that mean, right? Am I of service? Do I have purpose? It all kind of ends up in this cool area. And this is why it's very hard for me to say, hey, this is my coaching philosophy. Yeah. Because once you boil all the bullshit away, this is where the fascinating stuff lives. So, yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry we didn't talk about football. I'm sorry I didn't run through my resume. Episode no. 1000 is going to be lit because we're going to go like step by step how I got here. Do I have a full, like a back four? Or do I have an inverted full back on the <laughs> inside? 
you know? No, it's the, it's the beautiful thing about this is like, I think as it's grown for me, there was probably uh, episodes in the early days where I cared about that stuff. And I would, you know, bring on a coach and say, hey, let's break down the tactics. And now, you know, like we already alluded to, like, I'm just fascinated with story more than anything. So, you know, and that's kind of the beauty of, I think, us now is even, you know, you can attest this as well. Even when we jump on the phone, half the time, we might not even talk about football half the time. It's like, or we talk about it for five minutes. You maybe mentioned a couple players. I mentioned this, that, and the other, and then we're talking about something completely different. And that's, what's been so amazing to, to have for me as well. Is like, cause yeah, I think you need that too. Like your relationships with people should also evolve and grow and have multiple dimensions to them, especially when they're this, when they're this close. I mean, listen, just for the people out there, I had my tactics board up here. I have, I have all my notes, I have my formations, <laughs> I have my records at Chestnut Hill, I have players that I should have signed, players I should have released. It's all here. It's, it's, it's purpose was to make me who I am now, right? So yeah. just because, again, I, there's, 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 there's somebody, I can feel them. They're right in the comments section. The right now, I'm just roasting them. I'm just like, hey, I was prepared. I was prepared. I had, I had everything, you know. Uh, yeah, and I have my, I have mine right here as well. I've got it all. I've got Abington. I've got Swarthmore. I've got Gold. I've got it listed. But this is the beautiful thing about this people is when you when it goes a different way, sometimes you just ride the wave and don't try and bring it. And for anyone that wants to interview people, don't always try and bring it back to your stupid questions that you wrote down. And don't ask people like a bullet point question one. What did you blah, blah, blah. no? If it takes you somewhere, yeah, it takes you somewhere. Sense. To be fair, though, when you're dealing with people like me who have, like, the answer just goes off into the weeds, part of the skill of an interview is to keep it cohesive. But then sometimes you just want to shoot the shit. And, like, listen, I'll tell anybody who's listening to this, one, God bless you for getting this far into this podcast. Um, most of our conversations run this way, right? Like, yeah. And this is what I aspire to have with any player that I work with is an actual relationship with the person because then you have a seat in their journey and you get to live multiple lives, right? I'm not in Australia right now hustling to chase a dream, but I can talk to you about it. And as long as I'm not judging it, I am in Australia chasing a dream, right? And like, that's, that's, that's the beauty of it. So, yeah, I mean, listen, I, I hope <laughs> I hope this was useful. I always find it really cool. Um, and if we need to do a soccer, I'm just telling people, episode 1000 is going to That'll be soccer. Next. I'm going to come yeah. with a whole tax tactics board. I'm going to have clips. I'm going to have like little, <laughs> I'm going to have my whole, you know, coaching philosophy, my way for A license. I'm going to be able to break that all down. Um, but yeah, like, listen, you're. People are more interesting than the things they do is where I've kind of settled at this stage. So if you get a chance to interview a person and, you know, this is for the next, so this is for the next 900 episodes you're going to do or 800, no, 900, yeah, 899 episodes are you going to do? If you can get to a point where people are just them, right? Because then you can connect the dots. You can start figuring out where the success came from. I think what's really cool for, with a lot of players that you've interviewed is I start listening. Like once you guys get through the whole resume part, like I'll be honest, I skip through a lot of that sometimes. I am more fascinated with the conversation that you had before the podcast started and the one you have at the end. After, So yeah. the person's really nervous and then they've come through it and they're just themselves the skill is bringing that into your podcast because that's where the seeds are, right? Like that's where the seeds of their success. That's where the seeds of their failure. That's where the seeds of, like, that's kind of where it lives, right? Is in those interstitial spaces. And that is why I love coaching because it gives me a door into another human being's experience. And that is my purpose, right? That is the thing that's the truest heart of who I am. But I can say that more eloquently at 35 than I would have been able to do at 25. And I'll be able to say 
clearer when I'm 65 than I am now. So bringing it back to football, your growth as a person impacts your ability to teach the game, but it also shapes how you appreciate different elements of it. So again, bring it full circle again with the mental health aspect or for players who are transitioning, allow yourself to be all these things and try to bring who you are into what you do, but also allow what you do to grow you into who you're going to be. You know, bro, if I was on Instagram, I'd be killing all these quotes. Ooh, the captions in my caption game will be strong. You're lucky I'm not an IG. You go get yourself a podcast, bro. You have the opportunity to do it all day long. You'd be good at this. You know you would. Dude, I love the sound of my voice too much to have a podcast. It would be the mo- you'd listen to it and go, you know what? Yeah, I'm done. I don't, I don't need, I don't need this nonsense in my life anymore. Oh my god, dude! With the, hey, the listen, metaphors, before- the analogies, everything that you could bring to it, man. You you reference freaking Pokemon in this episode. You reference all these different, like you, you would have it. Listen, I told you, my only goal on this podcast is to get my Mama G merch. Yep. And to get whoever actually makes it through to the end of this to go, I don't know what the fuck these guys are talking about. I enjoyed it. I feel better about my day. I have no fucking clue what... By the way, your editor who has to put a title together for this, God bless you for the work you're doing. Because none of the stuff, it's gone left, it's gone right, it's gone all over the place. But before you kick me out, because you need to, and I need to, because I need to go get ready for bed. You need to go to bed, yeah. (laughs) I want to put this on the record. I love you dearly. I am deeply, deeply proud of the person that you are. I am very excited to see what you do next. And yeah, I needed to say that. I did tell you earlier that I'm not going to give you any compliments. So like clip this and just run it on a little loop. Just, Just run a little loop. But I think to be quite honest, not enough people say how... You know that expression Nori always says, like, give people their flowers while they can smell them. I'm so fucking proud of who you are as a person. I try to tell you this every time I talk to you because I think it's one day you will actually believe it. Like one day I'll actually kind of get in there and it'll become a part of who you are. Uh, But no, dude, this is awesome. It was a privilege to be on here. I'm going to go back in the Reddit thread where I belong and just keep talking shit about (laughs) random stuff. But again, I need that Mama G gear drop ASAP. ASAP. I, ASAP. I appreciate the words, man. I appreciate you coming on to, uh, yeah, it's, it's been one that I've had circled since really the inception of this. And I know I, I already, I already did my spiel here at the top. So it, it goes without saying, it goes without saying how much I love, how much love I have for you, how much I care for you, how much you've meant to me over the course of, you know, the past couple of years since we've known each other. So I can't thank you enough, man. I really can't. Listen, you're very welcome. Keep crushing it. Episode 1000. I'll be back. Okay. I need that Mama G gear drop. Like, again, I, I think you think this is a game, <laughs> but I might not show up for episode 1000 if I don't get my gear drop. And Mama G, if you're listening to this, we have your back. We're, we're, we're in the comments section. Just, we're, we're, we're just, yeah. We just have your back. Um, and give my love to everybody when they come over to Australia. That's going to be awesome. That's it for this episode. I know we ran a little bit long there at the end, so I won't keep you too long here. Uh, thank you to Coach Zach. Thank you to all of you out there who are listening. Thank you for getting us to 100 episodes. That is freaking nuts. And I, I can't thank you guys enough. I love you. appreciate your support. Patreon.com slash in the 11 pod. If you want to show a little bit of extra support, I will catch y'all on episode 101. And here's the road into 100, baby.